Thank you very much. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Ingela Dahlgren. I am a critical care nurse. I'm also the director of SCIU Nurse Alliance of California, 35,000 nurses strong. And I just want to point out that I made my um, uh, contribution to the diversity. My husband is a nurse, he's a critical care nurse, and so is my son. So I'm here to support the board. Yes, the board has problems. We are in full support of continuing to work with the board uh, in all their aspects and trying to make um, the process a little bit easier for all of us. Um, they have had an absolutely incredible workload where they, they have not, as we have heard from all my other colleagues, where their pleas for extra staff has not been met. How can you expect a board to function when you have 50% of the staff? If I had 50% of the staff in my critical care unit, patients would die. And that's why we have the staffing ratios. But it has to be put into to the contest of why is there so many voices trying to tear down the organization than instead of trying to help to build it. And I want to echo my brother that was just here, um, uh, the male nurse, and call for us to join together with our board. Uh, we in SEIU, we actually go to the board meetings every month and believe me, they will hear our voices and we are heard and our solutions are heard and discussed. And I think this is an integral part of what we as nurse unions and nurse organizations do. So uh, I, in our opinion, there is no reason why we should tear apart a board that has barely gotten any time to function together apart again without um, instead, we should just try to help them to get the work done. And I promise that I and my organization will do our best to help. Thank you. Next speaker. I thank you, Alex Hawthorne, on behalf of the California Association of Nurse Anesthetists. We represent about 2,000 certified registered nurse anesthetists in the state that administer expert anesthesia and pain management services. We strongly support the Board of Registered Nursing and respectfully ask that you extend the sunset. Thank you. Thank you very much. My next? Yes. Good. Good are. afternoon. Last one. Sure. Oh, wonderful. Uh -huh. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Carol Stanford, and I am a retired employee. I mean, I used to be working for the board a few months ago, and I am retired, and I came out of retirement to show my support for the Board of Registered Nursing, uh -huh. having worked there, having been involved with the diversion program, with all aspects of the uniform standards. Um, when we, I was on the committee for when we did the uniform standards. I understand the importance of the uniform standards for substance abuse. I understand where they came from, and I understand the information and what um, your committee is trying to do to protect the public, and I applaud you for doing that. And I just wanted to come here today as a support to let you know that the board is going in the right trajectory, that they are doing what they need to do. It is taking time for them to get all their little pieces put together the way that they want to, but I see them doing that. And I also wanted you to just to take note when you read some of the information that is in this um, document, some of it is not quite on point, um, for instance, when it talked about the substance abuse issues, there are some inaccuracies in that information that was um, listed in there. So I just wanted you to take a look at, when you look at the audit that went on with Maximus, which was the contractor, it indicated there were just a few little um, uh, glitches in that audit, and overall, Maximus was established, and you'll see that when you do the dental board, um, their background paper said it was already established as a as a, a contractor that was meeting the requirements and effectively monitoring substance abuse nurses um, for all of the programs. That is in the background papers for the dental board. So I just want you just to take it with some information that the numbers that are there, when it indicated that there is a low relapse rate, there is a low relapse rate, and that is in conjunction with all of the alternative uh, to uh, discipline 
programs across the country, when there's that kind of monitoring, when there's that kind of drug testing, when there's that kind of investment, the relapse rates are low. So the one thing that if I would ever have anything that you can do to increase people coming into programs like the diversion program, that is the best safety that we can have for our, um, for our public. Because those programs are the programs that stop nurses from working, help them to be involved in recovery, get the help they need, and then get back into the workforce. This is the information that has been proved out time and time again that treatment does work. And I just wanted to come today just to give my support to what you all are doing here, to the Board of Registered Nursing, to the programs that they're trying to establish. And even though I'm retired on my own time, I think it's valuable. All Thank right? you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes our uh, public uh, participation uh, in, in the process here. Clearly, we have a job in front of us. Um, we have uh, a report. Uh, we have a response to the report. We have the input of professionals uh, in the um, in the field, uh, but there is work to be done because there is a recommendation here, um, and fortunately we have some time. So uh, I think in my concluding comments, my comment to the board would be uh, either this is a, a only a massive communication problem or um, it is a, a problem uh, of substance where there have to be some changes made. And so we have some time. We would welcome your active and uh, proactive participation in resolving the issues that have been brought up before us, uh, of course, with the intention of achieving a successful outcome uh, moving forward with the very important representation and uh, uh, regulation uh, and position that the board holds. Uh, but we do need to get these issues addressed. So thank you so much for that. And we will look forward. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We're just going to wrap it up. We can talk privately or we have staff available also. So thank you so very much. And we're going to move on. We have a time constraint here that we're uh, really functioning under. But thank you. And uh, we will look forward to these answers coming forward from the board. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the uh, vocational um, nursing and psychiatric technician uh, board. And I'll tell you, we have a... Uh, we only have until 20 minutes of four. We have a, a special session, a state of the judiciary address that's going to be given at, at that time. Uh, and then we will return for the dental board following that. So all the poor dental board people can take a break. Time to get a coffee. And uh, we'll spend the next 20 minutes and hope we can get this one done in, in 20 minutes. Welcome very much. It looks like we have Ta Todd DeBronstein. Is yes. that correct? Uh, thank you. That's and correct. then I'll let everyone else introduce themselves. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Or good afternoon. Yes. God, we've made it this far. My name is Todd DeBronstein. I am president of the Board of Vocational Nursing and Psychiatric Technicians. And I am also a licensed psychiatric technician member. I carry this license with me. Everywhere I go, I'm protected dearly. To my right is Samantha James Perez, board vice president, and also a licensed psychiatric technician uh, member. And she sits on a few of our committees. To my left is Teresa Bello Jones, our executive officer. Next to her is Angelina Martin, assistant executive officer. Cheryl Anderson is on the other side of the table. And next to her is Marilyn Kimball, our Enforcement Division Chief. Uh, for the record, Cheryl's title is Supervising Nursing Education Consultant. A little bit of background, the board began its legislative mandate to regulate the practice of licensed vocational nurses in 1951. In 1959, the legislature placed the Psychiatric Technician Certification Program under the board's authority. And in 1970, the PT certification program was changed to a licensure program. These are two distinct licensure programs under the oversight of one board. Each program has its own statutes, regulation, and budgetary budget authority, curriculum requirements, examinations, and staff. Like you've heard earlier with the other healing arts boards, our mission is to protect the public, and that remains our highest priority. 
the board members are aware of their critical role that we play in uh, consumer protection. I would like to emphasize that our board is a special fund agency and we do not receive any public funds or general fund money. Our revenue is solely derived from the collection of fees from our applicants and licensees. Currently, the board oversees over 142,000 licensees. That's approximately 129,000 LVNs and approximately 13,000 psychiatric technicians. The LVN and psychiatric technician educational preparation is typically comprised of 12 to 18 months of theory and clinical training. Our licensees are not independent practitioners. LVNs must work under the supervision of a registered nurse or physician and psychiatric technicians under the supervision of the director of services, typically a physician, surgeon, psychiatrist, or psychologist. The board is also responsible for the approval of the California Vocational Nurse and Psychiatric Technician programs. Currently, there are about 182 approved VN programs and 17 accredited psychiatric technician programs in the state of California. At present, the board has 27 applications pending to start new programs in California, and that breaks down to 25 VN programs and two psychiatric technician programs. Our board meets at least four times a year and conducts informational enforcement overview sessions that is convened in conjunction with the board's regu regularly scheduled meetings. Uh -huh. During our board meetings, we have between 300 and 1,400 uh, people in attendance. Um, maybe we, in the interest of time, be, um, could jump into the, the issue overview, because I'm, I am concerned. Sure. Would that be all right? Um, start with, with issue number four, finances. That would be wonderful. Four and uh, five together. Got it. And I'll turn it over to Teresa, and the others of us will fill in as needed. <coughs> I'm not sure why. I'm Teresa Bella Jones, and I'm going to start out with the <clears throat> excuse me, um, the board finances, and under that is um, the fund merger. <clears throat> During the 2011-12 fiscal year, the DCA Budget Office prepared our budget projections, showing that our VN program fund reserves would be exhausted by 2017-18, and the PT's program fund reserves would be exhausted by fiscal year. Uh, 2014-15. So in order to ensure the solvency of the programs, a statutory amendment for a fund merger was considered. Board staff met with, met with DCA, who indicated that with a merger, the board could track revenue by keeping sep separate fee categories unique between the two programs, and there would only be one fund and one appropriation, but the revenue categories would remain separate. In February 2012, the full board approved the proposal to merge the VM Programs Fund and the PT Programs Fund. Since that time, the projected deficit, projected deficit to the PT program has been delayed due to reversion. A statutory fee increase was rejected due to licensee and legislators' non-support. In addition, the PT fee would have to have been raised to over $400. The status of the funds Current fund conditions indicate that the VM program is projected to have approximately 14.1 months in reserve at the end of this fiscal year, and the PT program is projected to have six months in reserve at the end of the fiscal year. <clears throat> the VM program's fund reserves are projected to remain solvent beyond 2021. The PT program's fund reserves will be exhausted by 17-18. In January of this year, the DCA Budget Office informed the board that <clears throat> fiscal year 1415 expenditure projections uh, as of December 2014 show that the board would overexpend its VN program appropriation budget authority <clears throat> for fiscal 2014-15. Uh, to avoid a budget shortfall, the board must ensure that only mission critical expenditures are incurred until the budget is balanced. The largest deficit was projected to be in enforcement, and in January 2015, the board submitted a request to augment the VN budget by a total of 367,000, 332,000 for the AG, and 35,000 for the Office of Administrative Hearings. This request is pending <coughs> review by the Department of Finance. Uh, the budget report for February 2015 was received 
uh, recently, and based on expenditures through that month, the board has expended 72% of its budget authority to date. The board will continue to monitor expenditures closely and work with the budget office to more accurately determine projected expenditures through the end of this fiscal year. Uh, inadequate staffing levels was the next issue that's on the agenda. Um, the yeah, seven. Yes. yes, I'm sorry, I don't have the numbers uh, on them. The board continues to work very hard, of course, to fill its vacancies and tries to fill them as soon as possible. But it continues to struggle. Although we work closely with DCA's Office of Human Resources to recruit and hire employees as effectively and efficiently as possible, uh, it's not always in our control. The board has a total of 69, excuse me, 67.9 authorized positions, 57.5 VN, 10.4 PT. Currently, there are 11.5 authorized positions vacant, which is a 17% vacancy rate. As noted in its Sunset Review report, it can take an average of four to six months to hire employees. Five of the board's 11.5 vacant positions were vacated within the last three months. One vacancy will be filled April 1st. However, another position will be vacated that same day. The board is waiting for approval from uh, HR for two applicants and upon approval, the board will proceed to make tentative offers pending Corey clearance. The board has not lost its authority for any position due to failure to timely fill a position, including failure to advertise all available positions as noted in the background paper by the committee staff. <coughs> The board approves voluntary overtime for staff who are willing to work <clears throat> to assist with backlogs and workloads. The board was able to offer <clears throat> pay or uh, um, compensating time off for overtime. However, effective January 31st, the board terminated pay for overtime due to budget constraints and currently only uh, CTO is approved. Overtime is not mandatory, it is voluntary and staff are compensated currently by compensating time off. As always, the board plans to continue to work with DCA HR to fill its vacancies. School approval. The board advises all VN one, and- One second, if you oh, could sorry. I get a question on that. Yes. Why, why is the board having trouble filling the vacancies? Is there a particular issue that, that, that uh, kind of sticks out? Uh, well, the- uh, the board's vacancy rate has fluctuated. Um, at the time that there, of the um, hiring freeze, our vacancy rate was really as high as 38%. And part of that was because we had gotten the approval for 15.5 CPI positions. A few of them were limited term, but we got approved for that. And then also another BCP was approved at the time for four additional licensing um, positions. But we couldn't fill them because of the freeze. And um, around February of 2011, uh, when their part of the freeze restrictions were lifted a little and they, we could um, go for freeze exemptions to fill positions. Um, we did that immediately and um, we, we had about 15 positions um, approved to fill. Um, some of them um, were approved in June of 2011. Um, a couple others were approved in uh, November and uh, October and November of 2011. So we, and at, at the time then of the freeze, or when that was lifted, when we were able to go for freeze exemptions, um, our vacancy, no, I'm sorry. Is, is there a particular reason? I understand your vacancy. Well, well we, so we worked very hard, we worked very hard with HR to try to fill those vacancies. And at, at, at one point, um, we, we had um, a lot of our supervisors and managers were gone, which are very important in our selection process. So we did have to lean heavily on the budget office to assist us with the recruitment and hiring. Um, and that was in 2012 through 2013. Okay, thank you. I, I was just looking, looking for a specific reason. I mean, I understand that going through the different, you know, challenges of one point to another, is it not, the pay is not just, adequate, uh, if, education, you know, if I could also, one reason. If there oh, is one. one reason. No, if there is one, oh, one there reason. is one. Or two, okay. if there is one. If I could, there are, there. I've been a board member since 2005, so I've seen some of the fluctuation with um, board staff throughout the years. Um, sometimes we would hear that it's difficulty with Cal HR because they would wait until we had a group of applicants before they would I process see. them through to us. In some years, it was um, the freeze or the right. um, the pay wasn't able to, at a level able to uh, get a group of applicants. Now with our managers and supervisors, we have a compaction issue. Um, as our managers and supervisors 
Um, I don't wanna say they're all able to retire right now, but I have a fear that if they all retired at one time, I would have a difficulty, a difficult time filling the position because of the compaction issue. Okay. Thank you. School approvals. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, I just had a question. Yes, Mr. Um, um, and it, I'm just trying to resolve um, our, you know, our document here says that the committee staff has been tracking to the board since this last sunset review. It appears that some of the authority for positions may have been lost due to failure to timely fill the positions. That's in direct conflict with what you have said. So how do we resolve this? We haven't lost any positions due to failure to fill. We've reclassed some positions and downgraded some positions, but we haven't lost any. We lost positions due to the BL 1203 um, order, we've lost a couple, uh, some due to the uh, workforce cap, but we haven't lost any positions due to failure to fill. That's, that's why I I'm asking, what, how do we resolve this? Kind of in conflict, so we could, 